place. We welcome into these broken vessels. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, we want to go to the Word of God. We thank God for all the things He's already done. Thank Him for what He's doing right now, this very morning. Of course, we thank God for the vision and the things He's promised to do and shall do on our behalf even in the future. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to go to uh, the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians chapter 2. I want to read it to you here uh, just a few scriptures from there. And then there's several scriptures tonight that uh, we're going to uh, at least mention and perhaps even turn to uh, as we deal with the word tonight. Amen? Amen. Philippians 2. Philippians 2. I want to start reading. At verse number five, Philippians two, starting at verse number five. These are the words you'll find. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Amen? Amen. Amen. And, uh, and we want to just deal with tonight a few facts about form. A few facts about form. His bow, eyes closed. Father, we come once more again this evening, Lord. We come with thanksgiving on our lips. We're just grateful, Father God, that you've seen fit once more again to allow us to be here in your house where we can bask in your glory, even embrace your presence, Lord. We thank you. And Father God, we pray now, Lord, in the name of Christ Jesus. Touch our hearts, minds, souls, and spirit. Place us now in one accord in the spirit with you. It's our prayer now, Lord, that you would uh, allow us to behold wondrous things in your word, Lord. Father God, open up the scriptures unto us now. Father God, give us wisdom, knowledge, discernment, and understanding, Lord, that we be able to receive of your word. Father, it's our prayer that we become rooted and grounded in your word. So much so, Father, that even when we leave this place, we bear, bear fruit that's pleasing in your sight, that men may see our good works and glorify you in heaven. This is our prayer. We pray this prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Talk about a few facts about form. Amen. A few facts about form. And uh, I just go back to those scriptures once more and again, as it says here in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's first and foremost, that we be Christ-minded. Amen? That we focus on trying to have the mind of Christ. Amen? Well, in a nutshell, uh, what is the mind of Christ? You know, if we say that we're, we're Christ-minded, we're, we're Christ focused, Christ centered, we have the mind of Christ. And the scriptures tells us pretty much uh, what it means to be Christ minded. Okay, because what he says is, look at it in verse 6, he says, who being in the form of God, right? We know Christ represented, uh, recognized as 100% man and 100% God. We have the humanity of Jesus, we have the divinity of Jesus. Amen. But he says, uh, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Amen? And so we know that Jesus, if you listen uh, to the scriptures, that, that uh, many times, sometimes Jesus represented himself as God. Right? Uh, in fact, uh, what comes to mind is Thomas, you know, or one of the uh, uh, disciples was like, you know, show us the Father and it suffices us. Right? Can we remember that? Show us the Father and it suffices us. Say, man, I've been with you all this time, you don't know me. Right? So Jesus at that time was really representing himself what? As God. Pretty much telling him this. He said, man, look, no man has seen the Father at any time. Right? Only the God has declared him. But 
He says, when you see me, my attributes, the way I carry myself, the way I represent myself, man, you see in God. Amen? Amen? I hate to tell you and report to you, we have the same type of mandate as we call ourselves Christians. Amen? That, that, that there's, there's, we have loved ones, we have people in the world who would never set foot in the church, right? The closest they're going to come to God is you, really, as God's representative. The way that you carry yourself could, listen to me now, could draw those people to the Lord or push them away from the Lord. Amen. Amen? When you represent and say that you're a Christian, the way that you carry yourself could, look, look, I tell the story about my college roommate. I was talking to him the other day, a few days ago was his birthday. And this brother is the reason why I'm standing here tonight, I promise you. By the way that he carried himself, he would boldly proclaim that he was a virgin, right? That was crazy on the college campus for a brother, right? He, he, he would tell you, I don't cuss, and I never could catch this guy cussing. The way he carried himself, uh, Uncle Charles, drew me to him and made me see what a Christian really looks like. And we all have that mandate, amen? So once again, once again here in... Uh, Verse 6, he says, who being in the form of God, though not robbery, to be equal with God. Here it is. This, this is the part that we need to catch as well. He says, but made himself of no reputation. All right? He really saying, it ain't about me. Amen? It's all about him. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. He really wasn't a servant. He was a king. Right? But he, he, he took up on him the form of a servant. Amen? Because he didn't want to have the reputation, right, that of all that. That's why, that's why whenever the disciples came to him, you know, wanted to exalt themselves, he said, man, if you're going to be great, you need to be a servant. Amen? Because you got this thing twisted. You're looking at it from the wrong perspective. Can I help you tonight? Motives matter. Motives matter. It's not just enough to, good, to do a good, right thing. That's not enough to do a right thing, a good thing. It's not enough to serve God. That's not enough. Why are you serving him? It's more important. Why? Because, man, anybody can do something good sometimes. Why are you doing it, though? See, motives matter. Right? I, I can remember, you know, guys was hustling, girls doing all kind of, every so often they'd do something nice. But they still were selling poison on a consistent basis. And they would take their gun out and shoot people and hit kids with straight bullets, so on and so forth. Motives matter. As much as you're doing what you're doing, why are you doing it? It matters even more. So he says, once again, verse 6, who being in a form of God, uh -huh, thought about robbing you to be equal with God, but made himself no reputation and took upon him what? The form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Amen? And being found in the fashion as a man, watch this now, he goes another level. He humbles himself. Amen? Amen. He's already done come from glory, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And he made himself in the a, in a likeness of man. But then even as a man, he humbled himself. Amen? He's trying to show us something here. He says, and being, in a, and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. He's dealing with that the other week. Unto death, even the death of the cross. Amen. Which is at that time the most hideous death that you can die. Amen. All right. So we're going to talk about a few facts about form. A few facts about form. All right. First and foremost, when we think about form, we're in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, really verses 1, 2, 3, book of Genesis. We start at the very beginning, huh? Book of Genesis. I need the glasses sometime. Need lighting, better lighting in here. That's the next thing we have to do, I guess. All right, form. Look what the Bible says here in Genesis 1. And I'm going to read the first three verses. It says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without what? Form. And void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Verse 3, And God said, Let there be light, and there was what? Light. Amen? All right? So, 
it says that it was without what form. So God provided good form. Amen? Because when we read the rest of Genesis 1, we're going to hear the story of what God did, all his creation. And when he finished creating something, he said it was what? Good. It was good. So it was without form, uh, Pastor Roby. But here it is now. God has provided what? Good form. All right? Then we know what happens in Genesis 2 and 7. Amen? Say so God did what? He formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. All right? So here it is. We start out without form, but God is providing form as he, what, speaks the world into existence. He creates. And then he gets to man again, and he, what, he forms him from the dust of the ground and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. All right? So God really wants to take nothing and make something. Amen? Amen. That, that's what he does with us. He takes a, a nobody and makes a somebody. Amen? Yeah. He likes to deal with form. And, and that's what it, it, it we're, we're, we're like putty in his hand. At least idealistically, that's what we should be. And let's say, God, have your way. Amen. All right? Make of me what you want. Here it is. Talk about the pot and the clay relationship. Amen? Yeah. God is the pot and we're the clay. And let God shape, make, and mold us into what it is that he wants us to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. But, but of course, now we know we have an opposition. We have an adversary, the devil, right? Who has a roaring lion is seeking whom he may devour, right? So his whole thing is to what? To deform, right? God is trying to form things. The devil is trying to tear it apart. He wants to what? Deform everything that he comes in contact with. To God be the glory, right? He, he wants to take... The things that God is trying to form, and he wants to deform, he wants to destroy them, he wants to, to render them void, he wants to uh, make them where they don't work the way that they're supposed to work. All right? Let's look at uh, Genesis 3, 4 and 5, right? We know the story about what it is that God had done with Adam and Eve. He set them in this garden, in this pristine environment. He's blessed them. Everything is going great. He's given them some instructions, but of course, now Satan steps in because he wants to tear this down. Right? As you walk with God, Satan don't want to see that. He wants to destroy that, right? So he, 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 he tricks the woman. The Bible says, verse uh, Genesis 3, let's just look at 4 and 5. The Bible says, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not what? Surely die. For God do know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Amen? He told a lie, you shall not surely die. Right? And that's all it takes, man, is one little lie. One little lie can do great damage. Right? Uh, I used to qualify a little white lie as if it's harmless. Right? Because it's white. Uh, I don't know what that's all about. Right? But what the bottom line is, this is what I've come to find out. That a lie is as dangerous and devastating as any other sin. In fact, as we see right here, it could be the most devastating. Why? Because it is the most subtle. Right? Again, we qualify it as a little white lie, like it's harmless, like that's not that big of a deal. But a lie can do as much as any other sin, perhaps even more. Right? One brother, when, I, when I, uh, I've said that before, and I had a brother say, well, man, how are you going to equate a lie with a murder, bastard? Come on, huh? I mean, that's, but you can kill somebody with a lie. There's several folk who receive lethal injection because somebody bear false witness on the witness stand. That lie literally killed that individual. So, so a lie can be very, 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 what, devastating. And so because of this lie, the things that God had formed and put in place, right? Just think about it now. If, 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 listen to me. 
if, if Adam and Eve never partake of that fruit, right? If they never take of, of the fruit of good and evil, listen to me now, and they do what they're supposed to do, which is to partake of the fruit of life, they would have been stuck in a, perf a perfect state, hence now and forevermore, right? And we, as their children, would have been in that state too. But because of that lie, because of that lie, everything became deformed. And now your, your natural inclination is to do wrong things. We need fixing on that to be that man or that woman of God that God has called us to be. Just to kind of show you what took place, let's go to Genesis chapter 6. That one sin, Satan deformed the things that God had formed in us. Amen? Amen. Look at what it says here in Genesis 6 and 5. It says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil, Continually. Right? Satan has done a masterful job of deforming things. Now we're all out of whack. Our nature has changed now. We think an evil, he said, continually. Are y'all catching this? Right? So, so God now, God had to really begin to inform man of who he really is and really supposed to be. See, that's part of the problem. We really don't know who we are in Christ. We really don't know who it is that God intended us to be. We really don't realize that we are kings and queens, right? It is. A lot of folk don't, I mean, they can't equate and understand that God says that we are the head and not the tail, that we are above only and not beneath, uh-huh, that really and truly we, we, we are the lender and not the borrower, amen? Blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed going out, blessed coming in. We, I mean, that's who you are in Christ. Amen? You are the very righteousness of Christ. That's, but we, we, we can't see that because what? We've been deformed, right? But God wants to what? Inform us. He wants to inform us. And that's why he, he, he even informed the devil in Genesis 3 and 15. Amen? You flip back there. Genesis 3 and 15. He, he informed the devil. He let him know, like, hey, boy, you got a good one in on me there. You didn't, you didn't go through the front door. You went through the back door. What am I talking about? You, you, didn't, you didn't approach the man that I talked to and I set up. You backed over. You, you, you got slick as you are. And you approached the woman. You caught her off base and she didn't understand it quite and, and it got messed up. He said, but oh, I got something for you. That's what he tells him here in 15. He says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman. He's talking to the serpent. And between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Amen? Right. He, he's letting them know. He said, well, you, you got me right there, but I got something for you. Bottom line, I win in the end. Mm -hmm. Right? It's going to take a little time, but time doesn't matter to God because God does not live in time. Right? So he says, uh, uh, in the twinkling of an eye, man, by and by, I'm going to get this thing. Look at it now, and, and let us know this. See, what I love about it, this didn't sneak up on God. God, God had everything on point. How long? From the foundations of the world. A lot of people think Jesus was crucified 2,000 years ago. Yeah, we can look at that from a natural standpoint, but in the spirit, he's the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. Amen? And listen now, and, and, and his quest to inform man of who we are and what we're supposed to be doing has been in effect how long? From the foundations of the world. How can you say that, Pastor Roberts? I'm glad you asked. Let's look at Jeremiah. Amen. Look at, look at what he tells Jeremiah. We, you, you, you've said it a gazillion times, I'm sure yourself. But look at point blank what he tells Jeremiah. Let you know that this, this plan of God he just didn't wake up one day and say, this is what I'm going to do. It's, it's been laid out, right? Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. The Bible says, then the word of the Lord came unto me, talking about Jeremiah, 
saying, how long? Before I formed thee in, thy, in the belly, I knew thee. And before I came forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Amen? Amen. God, God, he, he, he informed his prophets from the foundations of the world. Those individuals, here it is, even of the fivefold ministry, that there was something planted in them from the foundations of the world. That we would go forth to inform people about who they really are and who our God is. Amen. And who the devil is. Amen. It's important if you really know who the devil is. The Bible says when it's all over and said and done, that we're going to be looking at Sam. And this is the guy that was terrorizing the world. Amen. Hell. Yeah. So, so, so God has to inform us, and He does that by way of His word, by way of His prophets. Amen. To God be the glory. Well, watch this now. Of course, Satan, Satan is trying to make sure that we are what? Misinformed. God has his word here for us, right? But Satan is trying to make sure that we are misinformed. Yeah, the devil wants to what? Misinform us. Look at what the Bible says. Let's go to St. John. Yeah, he, he, he wants to mess, mess the message up. That if we don't receive what it is that God has for us, that we can walk in authority. Right? And we know what he does. He lies. He lies over and over, right? Look at what it says here in John 8 and 44. He says, Ye are your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And abound not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Amen? Amen. His whole thing is to what? Misinform you. I need you to understand, watch it now, that a half truth is a whole lie. <laughs> see, see, that, that's another thing. Y'all need to understand that Satan does not come to you. Uh, dressed in a red suit with a pitchfork. He's sneaky. He's subtle. He's slick. Right? My father-in-law gave me a good one a long time ago, Mr. Silver, when I first met him. And Mr. Elkins says, the devil is never going to approach you with a $3 bill. I looked at him. Oh, where is he coming from? With this? He said, because the $3 bill don't exist. He's going to come to you with something as close or real to the, I mean, close to the real McCoy as he possibly can. That's the way he's operating. Right? He's not going to come to you in this far-fetched. No, man. It's going to be something close, so you got to really be on game. you got to really be on point. Because he's trying to what? Misinform you. Yeah. That's why this, the Bible says, what? My people perish. Why? Lack of knowledge. They don't know because he you're misinformed. You know, that's why the Bible tells us we got to do what? Study to show our self-approval. Workmen that need not be saying rightly divine the word of truth because it can't be done wrongly. Right? It's just serious business. And, and, and our adversary ain't no joke. He's an ancient serpent. He's been around a long time. He's, he's getting victory over people just off his experience, not off of his power. He gets victory over us off of his experience, right? And his, his, it is his tested approaches that he knows work. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It's been proven over and over for generations and centuries, a gazillion years, right? This experience is not power, because the Bible clearly tells us that God has given us power over all the power of the enemy. So he's not beating us because of his power. You hear people professing all day, every day, the devil's soul is busy. And he's busy in your life because of his experiences. Right? We're not using our power over him because we're not submitting ourselves. I'm getting ahead of myself now. All right? Mis misinformation. Here it is. Because the devil blinds our eyes. Uh, let's look at it. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. 
chapter 4, verse 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. We can, we can start at verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, right? In whom the God of this world, we know that's the devil, right? The God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not. It's the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Amen? So folk are misinformed because they, their eyes get blinded. You know, and, and I'm telling you, when, when we reject God, when we walk in disobedience, when we walk in rebellion, that our eyes become what? Blinded. And now, even when the word does go forth, you miss it. Because you've given the, the devil the opportunity to blind your eyes, so you fall into even more mischief. Uh, mischief. Amen? Amen? All right. So then, check it out now. The devil, he moves to have you to continue to conform. Uh -huh. We're talking about a few facts about form, right? And I'm telling you, once, once you become misinformed, then the devil tried to lead you to, to conform, right? In other words, to come in agreement with the foolishness of the world. To come in compliance with the crazy things of the world. When you begin to take a stance, right, in those evil things or that wicked way, or, or, or doing things that you know are not of God. Yeah, have, have you ever had perhaps a loved one or a friend or somebody that you grew up with that you knew? You know, you knew them to be a certain way, you know, when y'all were younger or whatever, and now you see that they're so far away from God, you know, and they take these, these negative approaches and bold wicked stance, and you're like, man, that dude or that woman was nothing like that, you know, way back. Well, now they conforming, they, they're really complying with, with, with the negative way of living, with the wicked way of living. They've embraced it now as if it's all right, okay? So, so we know what the Bible says, let's go, let's go back to Romans here. Let's go to Romans. Y'all know where I'm going, right? Romans 12, it tells us clearly Romans 12 and 2. He says, and be not conformed to this world. Right? Don't, don't embrace the things of the world. Don't agree in coming in compliance with the things of the world. Right? That's what he's telling us. He says, and be not conformed to this world, but be you what, rather? Transform. Transform. How? By the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, how your mind is going to get renewed? Can I be honest with you and tell you that, that most of the time it ain't going to happen overnight? It is a what? Process. Amen? Amen. It's a process. In fact, we can call mind renewing a thing that we call sanctification. Amen? When you're moving further from the old man to the new man, it's a process. It's consistency that we partake of God's word. It's consistency that we, we pray to the Lord. It's consistency that we lift up holy hands, that we can grow in the things of God. Yeah? That's how we become what? Transformed. That we get purged from the wicked ways of the world. And that we begin to embrace the holy ways of our God. It's transformed. It's transformed. It's a mind shift. It's a paradigm shift in the way that you, you live. Amen? Where the things of God take precedent of the things of the world. It's a process in most cases. I've, I've heard and seen of cases where, where God, uh, individuals just have an encounter. And based upon that encounter overnight, man, they just got transformed. Usually, can I tell you, can I tell you the truth? Usually it's a traumatic experience. Talking about life or death type of thing, right? And God spoke to them and they realized, oh man, I should have went just now. And, and it, it woke them, it shook them, right? And that they made a, a, an abrupt change in their life. But you don't see that too often. 
most of the time it's painstaking. It's a process that you got to walk with the Lord. you got to talk with the Lord in order for that type of transformation to take place in your life. Amen? Let's look at the Word. Let's look at the Word. Let's go to John. John. St. John chapter 8. Bless the name of the Lord. Just want to read until you hear verses 31 and 32. You're familiar with them. Just want to read them, though. Why should I read them? Why should I talk about them? Why should I say them? Because the Bible says, faith coming by hearing and hearing the word of God. Right? Faith don't come by that you heard. Right? It comes by hearing. And please don't forget that second hearing. And hearing the word of God. Well, old preacher told me that first hearing is just in your ears. That second hearing is in your spirit, amen? So you got to continue to hear it, amen? And I'll well, tell you what God told me. It's, it's one thing to hear from your preacher, uh, your man of God, a woman of God, or whoever it may be, but it's another thing to hear from the Lord in the spirit yourself one-on-one. -on -one. That's when you really hear it, amen? amen? Faith coming by hearing and hearing the word of God. It is in uh, John 8, 31 and 32. It says, then said Jesus to those Jews which, what, believed on him. Listen now. He says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you, what, free. Amen? The key is you got to continue in his word. That's why I'm always telling you to go home. Go home. And get in this one more time yourself with God. Amen. Continue in this way. Don't let it stop here. Don't let the devil, look, look, look. Don't let the devil get you with a good trick. Want to hear a good trick? Man, you went to Bible study tonight. That's, that's great. Good for you. Good, good. And don't pick up the Bible until Sunday. The devil loves you, man. He, he can work with you like that. But you got to go home and continue to get in the Word. Amen. That's the name of the Lord. So, so we're transformed. This is the process in which we are, what, transformed. All right? Okay, now, watch this. Huh. You want to become uniformed. That's just like Jesus. At one with God. Right? When we read the, the scripture open up from Philippians 2 and 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Right? And he said he didn't think it was robbery to become what? Equal with God. So we want to be one with God. See, that's the man, look, it's, it's key to be on one accord with God. Why do you think? I always pray that, amen, that we be on one accord in the spirit because I know that's where the power at with God. When you at one with God, when you're on one, on, when you on one accord with God, you're actually walking now in the power and the authority of God. Amen? amen? amen. To God be glory. Now, you, look, you, to be on one accord with God don't mean you got to be out front. You just need to be connected with God. Amen? I'm telling you, this, it's key, that's key, that's key. See, because the devil is going to recognize God. Anybody in there, y'all got, got big brothers, big sisters? Yeah. Anybody here? Okay, right? Do you remember growing up, right? Remember growing up? And, you know, I, I remember several times getting into stuff across the street, right? I remember one case, I won't call the brother name, he's bigger than me. And uh, <laughs> it's in the dice game. <laughs> it's in the dice game, right? Dude blew on me, took my money, right? But I went and got my big brother. I told him about what happened. Man, come on, let's go back out there, right? And as we walking up, I'm walking behind my big brother. The dude looked up. He knew what time of day it was. Oh, man, I was just playing. Man, I was just playing. Just like that, got my money back, right? And up to the point I'm making to you is, it ain't about you, but it's who you what connected to. Uh huh. Yes. It's who you connected to. What the word said: If you abide in me, and my word abide in you, you can ask whatever you will, and it's going to be done. All right. So, so it's you. Uh, uh, it's it's being on one accord with God, in line with God. Amen. Watch this. Uh, look and look at James four and seven. Right? When it says submit yourself to God, you know, resist the devil and he got to what? Flee. If I submit myself to God, if I'm on one accord with God, the devil can't do nothing with me. Here it is. 
Everything that Jesus did would have went down the drain if he don't pray that certain prayer. If he don't become uniform or on one accord with God. Right? Luke twenty two forty two. If he don't say, the, I call it the greatest prayer ever prayed. The greatest prayer ever prayed with understanding is not my will. When he regulated that prayer and said, not my will, but thy will be done. He got on one accord with God. Yeah, again, as I mentioned Sunday, Jesus, Jesus was keeping it real. Jesus was keeping it real. Jesus was saying, man, look, you know what? I really don't want to do this. I've already seen this in the spirit. I know about the pain and how bad it's going to be. I, Lord, I really don't want to do this. Is there another way? I'm not, I want to be obedient. I want to help out. Is there another way to? Right? And the Lord, evidently in the spirit, let him know, brother, this is the only way we can do this. He said, okay, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Uh-huh. He was uniform. He was uniform with God. He was on one accord with God. And that's what we got to get. We want to be on one accord with God. I'm telling you, if you don't want to call for God, you already have the victory. I don't care how it look right now. In the end, you have the victory. Amen? To God be the glory. Now, this is what you got to watch as you go. This is what you got to watch. You got to watch because Satan, man, ain't done yet. Satan, again, he uses his, his, Bible says, soul, his soul. And any beast of the field and all that. Bottom line, he's slick. He's crafty. All right? Hey, we can even say he's smart. I hate to say it from some perspectives. He, uh, he is smart from a certain perspective. All right? And so what Satan has learned to do, he tried to set us up where we get on the platform. See, he sets us up. Satan, Satan. Satan sets you up where you get on the platform. What, what, what am I talking about? So you see, Satan wants you to be puffed up. Satan, Satan wants you to think it's all about you. You know, any good things that's happening in your life, you know, Satan wants you to eventually, you know, take a bow. That's why I say I'm, I'm, I'm hooked on. I keep that fixed in my mind to God be the glory, to God be the glory. Right? Because when I go to thinking it's all about me, I've done something, worked something, I'm, I'm setting myself up for a fall. So the Bible says, war to them who become at ease in Zion. Amen? It's saying when you think everything is all right, it's all safe, as we say, it's all good, that's when you set yourself up for it to be all bad. Okay? So Satan wants you to get up on the, what? On the platform. Yeah, he wants you to take a bow. And if you can, if you can hit a low, what the Lord is always telling us, humble yourself, humble yourself. The Lord is telling, don't get on the platform. Can I tell you from another perspective? The Lord is saying, don't mess with my glory now. Don't mess with my glory. That's why the Lord is always consistent, consistently calling people who I call glory guarantors. Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced, I'm convinced, Sister Linnea, that's the only reason why he might have Call me, right? Because I gotta be a glory guarantor, Miss Sylvia. I know, I know, I ain't got it all together. I really do. I know I don't, right? I'm just going on obedience, amen. amen. But it said he, he called glory guarantors. If you look at the word over and over, Moses, man, hey, Lord, I can't even talk. How you gonna send me, right? Yeah. But Gideon, Lord, I'm the least in my family. How you gonna send me? Everybody had an excuse, right? Timothy, man, I'm, I'm just a boy, you know, Jeremiah, I'm just, a, everybody had an excuse who God chose, amen? But God's power went forth in their life. God used them, okay? So I'm telling you, stay off the platform, because Satan will present the platform to you. In fact, he'll help walk you up there, because he knows he's setting you up for what? A fall, all right? Look at what the Bible says in Matthew 23 and 12. That makes it, makes it real simple to me. Matthew 23 and 12. Look at what it says. You've heard it before. Do I have a right scripture? Yes. Matthew 23 and 12. It says, And whosoever, sound like it don't matter who it is, right? <laughs> he says, 
and whosoever shall what? Exalt himself shall be abased. Now, might, might be abased. He says, if you let him put you up on that platform, he says, you shall be what? Abased. He says, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Why do you think that? Now, you know why I'm stuck on to God be the glory. I don't want it to be none, man, nothing. Anything good about this ministry that has happened, I'm ducking. I ain't got nothing to do with it. To God be the glory. Yeah. Ain't never, he's not going to put me on no platform. Because I know that's a what? That's a setup. That's a setup. If you've done something from your heart, you know, people always say, the Lord know your heart. Brother, I want you to know he do. He really, really do. So if you've done something from your heart, you ain't got to blow the trumpet. You, know, you ain't got to get out front, God, no. You know, he never sleeps in no slumber. His eyes are on the sky. I know he's watching you. So all we have to do is to make sure that God get his glory. Stay off the platform. Humble yourself. Amen? Amen. All right. And then we can close out with these last two. We can close out with these last two. That's what we got to know. We know the devil, he's been doing his thing. He's trying to deform things. You want to misinform the people, you know. He wants you to conform to the negative ways of the word, and he definitely wants you to get up on that platform, right? But Jesus has come to reform. Jesus has come to reform. Amen? All the stuff that Satan has done to try to mess things up, Jesus has come to reform. And we got to be honest, Satan messed some stuff up. He really has. Based upon our disobedience, he's, he's messed up a lot of stuff. But Jesus said, don't worry about none of that. I come to what? Reform. I come to put it back together. I come to put it back in line. I come to put it back on one accord with the Father. Amen? Amen. Jesus come to reform. And that's why Jesus... Jesus justifies, amen? We are justified through Jesus. Now, no matter what it is that you've done, Jesus said, I can make it right. Uh -huh. And when God looks at us, he looks at us just as if we've never sinned. That's what the justification of Christ is all about. The work that he done is well done, amen? It's well done, right? He has reformed. He has put things back in right order with God. That's when we, we, we get that through him. When we, when we embrace him, again, we become the righteousness of Christ now. Amen? Amen? It ain't about us. It ain't about us. It's through the grace of God to God be the glory. God truly loves us, what? Unconditionally. Ain't that a blessing? See, so many people thinking, man, I got to go, I got to do this to make it up, bro. First of all, even you struggling, doing your best, ain't going to never be enough. Right? Our righteousness is but filthy rags in the sight of the Lord. If you're not relying on Jesus, I can tell you right now, you're going to come up short. Right? He says, I come to reform. I come to put it back in order. Anything that's lacking, anywhere that you're short, I got you. Amen? He comes to reform. Let's look at, let's look at what it says in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Bless the name of the Lord. Romans chapter 3. Let's look at verse 23. Start at verse 23 of Romans chapter 3. This first of all, this put us all in the same boat right off the box. <laughs> right off the box. Puts us all in the same boat. No, no, no big eyes or little U's. We all in the same boat right here. Right? Jesus says, all y'all need me. <laughs> I don't care who you are, what color you are, how much money you got, what part of the city you live in, what is, what is, uh, uh, public housing, or you live in a gay community, Jesus said, at the end of the day, everybody need me. Everybody need me. Everybody need me. Right? It is. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He didn't say one or two. He didn't say just the Jews. He didn't say just the, you know, uh, uh, the Muslims. Right? All. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But watch this though. He says, being justified freely by his what? Grace. Through the redemption. I'm telling you, he's reformed us. He redeemed us. He reformed us. That is in what? Christ Jesus. 
whom God has sent forth to be a propitiation. That's the substitute. A propitiation, a substitute through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he may be just and the justifier of him which believe in Jesus. Tell somebody, it's just all about believing. It really is. Because if you believe, he's going to pick you up and take care of everything else. It's already been provided by what? Grace. Something that you cannot earn or deserve. It's through the grace of God. If you believe that, Jesus says, I got you. I'm going to justify you. Well, when they say, man, what's up with this dude? Well, what's his problem? I got that. I'm standing for him. And God says, come on in, brother. Come on in, sister. All right? And lastly, and lastly, we reform. Right? Through Christ. But now, this is part, you know, because I understand to a degree. I understand to a degree. Uh, when you have people who cannot really understand the simplicity of salvation. Okay? A lot of folk can't understand the simplicity of salvation. What am I talking about? Well, you know, we, we got this need to earn something. You know, we, we, we feel like it's a catch to it. Really? That's, that's all, I, I, all I gotta do is believe? That, that's really it? You know, they feel like something is missing, like they gotta do something. Well, God would ask something of us, he really does, but it's not predicated upon us going to heaven. <clears throat> okay? But really and truly, there, there's a whole lot that God would have us to do. Right? God dealing with being able to deal with this Actually, sad to you believe, uh, to make it plain, sad to them to deal with this, but, but watch this. People say, or some people say, I love God. Okay, can, can, I, go, can I go a little deep? You don't have to love God to go to heaven. I might need to cut the mic off, huh? People think he's crazy. He really lost his mind. You do not have to love God to go to heaven. I'm sorry. The Bible backs that up. Because he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay? If you love me. That's what he says. If you love me, keep my commandments. All right? Thank God. Because last time I checked, ain't many of us keeping them. Thank God. It ain't about keeping us to be able to go to heaven. But in order to do the work, God wants us to go forward and to represent him. If there's a catch to salvation, that's it. Because that's what he really wants. He really wants us to love him. But, but, but the kind of love that he has put out is what kind of love? Unconditional. All right? So what that's saying is you don't have to love me the way I love you. That's really what it's saying. Right? But God gives us what we need to do what it is that he wants us to do. What is that? The Holy Spirit. Right? Because, 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 again, we have to go back to Genesis 6 and 5 to, to check on your heart again about how it's desperately wicked continuously. So we know in and of ourselves we're not doing all this good stuff. But it's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. It's the Holy Spirit that would have us to go forward to witness and to try to be a blessing to somebody. That's the Holy Spirit operating on the inside of you. Amen? So when we talk about performing, performing the things of God, that's, that comes from what? The Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus, now think about it, now. Think, think about this. Jesus don't walk with these disciples. Three years. They've seen this man do all kind of stuff. Right? You would think, you know, hung out with Jesus for three years, they've seen all kind of mind-staggering miracles that they ought to be powerful and ready to run out there and do some great stuff. But we saw what happened at the end of Jesus' life. <laughs> they had Jesus, they had Jesus singing a bow song. Where they at, where they at, where they at? They were gone. They left him hanging. It wasn't until they got what? The power of the Holy Ghost. 
residing on the inside of them that they were able to go forward with power. Otherwise, you're not going to perform it on your own. It's the Holy Spirit. That's our power to perform. That's why he told them, man, hey, y'all waiting in that upper room. Don't y'all go no more. Don't go out there and try to minister by yourself. You're going to be like the sons of Sceva. You're going to be running from the demons. Yes, sir. He says, man, wait. Wait right there into Jerusalem until what? Until the Holy Spirit come upon you. He says, and you shall receive power. What is the power for? It's the power is the power to witness. The power to go out and represent God the way that you're supposed to. Yeah. That's where the power to perform comes from. You don't have it in and of yourself. That comes from God. Yes. All right? And when you see that power to perform, then you can go forward and be used mightily by God to do things that you never could imagine. Because now, in and through you, he would do things better than you could ever imagine, act, or think. Amen? But it's through him that you receive that power to what? To perform. Amen? To God be glory. Amen. So, saints of God, that's just a few facts about form. Amen? A few facts about form. Hands about. Hands about. Eyes are closed. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give your name the honor. We give your name the glory. We're just grateful, Father God. Once again, Lord, that we here in your house, Lord, that we focus on you, Father God, that we all want to call with you in the spirit, Lord, being led and guided by your spirit. Lord, I pray even for those under the sound of our voice here in the sanctuary, as well as those who are watching by live stream. This is our prayer now that you would seal this word in the hearts, minds, souls, and spirits in your people, Lord. We pray, Father God, that we continue to be on one accord with you, Lord, even when we go home, Father God, that we would visit these scriptures once more and again, Lord, to allow you to minister to us and to engraft them into our spirits that we can be used mightily by you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we offer up this prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Bless the name of the Lord as always. We don't want to take it for granted that everyone uh, has a right standing relationship with our Lord Savior Jesus Christ. Therefore, we offer Christ to you, my brother. We offer Christ to you, my sister. If you're under the uh, sound of this word, it's in your heart to receive Jesus as Lord and personal Savior, or to return back to Him uh, from a backslidden state, or to become a part of what we're doing here at Holy Anointed House of Prayer. I want to lead you into prayer of repentance. The body of Christ is going to be in agreement with us. I want you to focus on Christ Jesus and Him crucified on our behalf. Repeat these words after me. Father God, I come now repenting of my sins and asking forgiveness of all my sins. Father God, come into my heart, creating me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Father, I believe that Christ Jesus hung, bled, and died on Calvary's cross, that he rose from the grave on the third day with all power in his hand. And even right now, he's seated at your right side, praying for me. And because of this, I believe in my spirit. I'm saved. I'm saved. I am saved. To God be the glory. You repeated that prayer. Indeed, you're saved. Indeed, you're in right standing uh, with the Lord. Of course, we, as always, we would tell you to get up with the Bible, believe in church. Of course, we here at Holy Lord the House of Prayer make ourselves available to you to help you work out your soul salvation. To God be the glory. Also, uh, we give you an invite to be with us, of course, on Sunday at 1145 as we go forward with our Holy Communion service. As well, we want to give you an opportunity to sow a seed into the ministry. You can do that by way of Cash App, or way of Square, or Give a Fire, or you can do it by old-fashioned way, by mailing it to our mailing address, 1373 Senate Street, here in the city of New Orleans, 70122. Bless the name of the Lord. May God bless you and keep you. This is indeed our prayer. Once again, I hope to see you uh, tuned in or here in the sanctuary, 1145 Sunday. To God be the glory.